The following recording of the first few pages of this book are brought to you by the Tulsa City County Library as part of our Kids Read Curious World Project. My name is Mr. Paul. Voyage of the Dogs by Greg Van Eekout Chapter 1 Lopside hoped to find a rat. He sniffed the passageways, and he sniffed the bulkheads, and he sniffed inside the elevators and beneath the food heaters and the galley. He sniffed the waste vents, and he sniffed inside the agricultural dome, aching to catch that familiar rodent scent. Ratting was one of the most important jobs on the Laika, and Lopside was the ship's ratter. He was named Lopside because one of his ears stood straight up like an antenna, while the other flopped over his eye. He had fierce teeth and a keen sense of smell to go along with a body that weighed no more than a small sack of kibble. His coat of black and cinnamon-brown fur was always unruly, even after a fresh brushing. Wherever there's people, there's rats. Roro liked to say. Roro was the ship's agricultural engineer and senior dog wrangler, and she was Lopside's very best friend. In the days of wooden sailing ships, the rats would scramble up gangplanks and skitter across mooring ropes. They'd settle in dark holds, eating away at stores of biscuits. So, wherever a ship docked, whether it was a busy port or desert island, the rats would come with it, from dock to ship, from ship to dock. Always rats, rats and people. They even say a rat stowed away on the first voyage to Mars. But Lopside wasn't just looking for rats. His official job on the Laika was to sniff out trouble of any kind. He knew what the ship was supposed to sound like, what noises were normal, and what noises could mean a problem. He knew what the decks were supposed to feel like under his paw pads, and he knew how the ship was supposed to smell. He was trained to detect burning odors, the bitter stink of melting wires and overheated power transfer junctions. A fire on a starship could be deadly. So he spent hours every day combing the ship with his nose fully engaged. His body was small enough to squeeze into tight spaces that the human crew had a hard time reaching, and his nose was even more sensitive than a lot of their sensors. Hey, Lopside, do you have a spectrum calibrator on you? Lopside lifted his nose from the deck plates and stared up into the eyes of crew specialist Dimka. He wagged his tail at him and barked, Sure do! Lopside wore a backpack with pockets that held an assortment of tools, spanners, radiation probes, calibrators, and anything else the crew members might need. He liked how the backpack made him useful, and the sensation of the straps wrapped snugly around his belly comforted him. He bit a plastic tab dangling from one of the straps to open the pocket where he kept his spectrum calibrator. Specialist Dimka reached down to grab it and gave him a scritch behind the ears. His hands smelled like lemons and coolant. Good boy, Lopside. I'll come by the kennel after my shift to give this back. Lopside wagged his tail and continued on his way. The corridors echoed with greetings as Lopside continued his patrol. Hey, Lopside! Hi, Lopside! Who's a good boy? Lopside's a good boy. He made his way to the agricultural dome, delayed by encounters with more crew members, many of whom insisted on petting him, scritching him, or even giving him treats. The dome rose higher than a maple tree, a web of support struts with transparent panes of plasteel in between. Solar lamps shone from the ceiling, bathing the dome in a delicious warmth that felt like being wrapped in a blanket. On the ground, new crops sprouted in a field of neat rows, some of them in beds of soil, and others in white hydroponic containers of chemical nutrients. Outside, all was stars, like glowing silver fleas against a vast black void. Lopside found Roro on her knees beside a mound of fertilizer, planting garlic. Of all his jobs on the ship, his favorite was was helping Roro tend the crops that would feed the crew once they landed on Stepping Stone. He ran to Roro, dropped his pack, and flipped over to expose his belly for a rub. Roro gave the best belly rubs. How was ratting today? Lopside barked and wriggled happily in the dirt. It went pretty great. I sniffed the engineering module, 
command and control, and the communications array. I detected no problems. Good, Rora said. Lopside thumped his tail. He liked praise. I didn't find any rats, though, he said, his tail slowing just a little. But I did get scritches from Crew Specialist Dimka, Metek Murph, and a biscuit from Commander Lin. When Lopside spoke to the human crew, he didn't do so in words, but with barks and gestures and postures. He communicated with the angle of his ears, with the way he cocked his head, with the speed and direction of his tail wags. And the crew members of the Laika, from the commander to the most junior assistant engineer, were equipped with translation chips that turned dog communication into human language. Sounds like a busy shift, Roro said with a smile. But try not to overeat. Remember, you're going into hibernation in the morning, and you can't digest treats in deep sleep. Mm, we still get dinner, right? Lopside never went hungry on the Laika, but he was still always very concerned about his feedings. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get your kibble. Now, do you want to help me work or not? Hand me a thermal probe, please. Of course, Lopside barked, rolling over to his feet. The next morning, the dogs of the Laika gathered in the hibernation chamber. They arrived even before Roro, because Champion had ordered them to. Champion was a golden retriever with a coat like polished brass and dark eyes that gleamed with intelligence. On Stepping Stone, her job would be search and rescue. On the ship, she served as Commander Lin's assistant and leader of the dog pack. She strode up to Lopside, alert and confident, and sniffed his muzzle. You smell nervous. Worried about hibernation? Mm, of course not. There's really nothing to be afraid of. It'll be just like taking a nap. A six-month-long nap, Bug grumbled. Bug was a black, white, and tan corgi, shaped like a squat log with big bat ears. He worked in the engineering module and tried to act like the engineers, who were a cranky bunch, probably because they were tasked with maintaining the ship's important systems and knew what could happen if any of them broke down. It won't be like that at all. Champion said, giving Bug a withering glare. We'll go to sleep, and then wake up, and it won't feel like any time has passed. Nothing to fret over, Lopside. I'm not fretting, Lopside barked. He was the smallest dog of the pack, and the only non-purebred, and just because he was, in fact, worried about hibernation didn't mean they needed to have a conversation about it. I'm terrified, Daisy said. I think we're all gonna die. Daisy, the Great Dane, was still a puppy, with a head the size of Lopside's entire body and legs like a giraffe. She worked in cargo, helping move bulky crates, and on the planet, she'd assist with construction. Bug offered the most assurance he was capable of. Hibernation isn't always fatal. We might not die. But we're not going to eat for six months, Daisy wailed. I'm going to starve. Daisy took a gallop around the hibernation chamber. She liked to gallop when she was worried. She also liked to gallop when she was happy. Or hungry. Or full. Or awake. The other dogs tried to make themselves smaller to avoid a collision. Lopside told himself he'd be okay. Yes, hibernation carried some risks, but that was true about every part of space travel. And even though they'd be asleep, the pack would be together. Pack was closer than friendship. Closer than family and Lopside knew Roro would never put him or his packmates in danger. She was just as much as pack as the dogs. Thinking about that helped him feel better. Besides, hibernation was a necessary part of the mission. The journey to Stepping Stone was the first Earth expedition outside the solar system, a trip so long that the crew would have to spend part of it in hibernation to save on resources like food and water. In hibernation, they didn't have to eat, they didn't have to drink, and they used less precious energy. The Laika had launched from Earth months ago, heading out past the moon, beyond Mars, dodging the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, moving past the grand gas giants, out farther than Pluto, farther than the Urt cloud, where comets were born, out and out, until even the mighty sun was just a pinprick of light. 
The dogs were awake for all that time, but they would be in hibernation in the deep space gulf between Earth's solar system and the system of the star HD 24040, 152 light years away. Eventually, they would land on the star's fourth planet, which space operations had named Stepping Stone. There, the crew would erect shelters, they'd farm their own food, and they would explore an entirely new world. If they were successful, more ships would come, and the outpost would grow, and from there, they would launch new missions to even farther stars. The Laika was just one small step into a giant leap of limitless possibility. Of course, the humans couldn't go alone. There had to be dogs. Because wherever humans went, dogs came along. Like rats, only more helpful. Dogs would herd livestock. Dogs would keep watch against the unknown. And most importantly, dogs would keep the human crew company during the long space flight. And on their new home far away from Earth. But first... They had to get there.